All right. So welcome everyone. Um, hello, and so glad that you're able to join us today for the first uh, COVID Info Commons webinar of 2021. Happy New Year. Hope many good things ahead. Uh, and we've got many great speakers for you today. Um, as a reminder, uh, this is a monthly webinar uh, organized by the COVID Information Commons project team uh, that is brought to you by the Big Data Innovations Hub uh, with many thanks uh, for support from the NSF Convergence Accelerator. Uh, so we've got a really great lineup today uh, that we're happy to share with you. Um, at the end of the event as well, we are going to be talking a little bit more about the uh, COVID Information Commons Undergraduate Student Paper Challenge. This was announced uh, at the end of last year in our December event, and it's an opportunity this spring uh, for undergraduate students to participate in ongoing COVID research uh, and learn more about all of the great work that uh, scientists such as those about to speak with us today are doing. Uh, I've included a bit.ly here to the student challenge um, and our student Helen Yang will be uh, discussing this further later on in the event. In the meantime, however, I'm truly delighted to be able to introduce you to our seven speakers today. Um, we've brought together these researchers who are funded uh, by COVID awards from NSF on a variety of different topics um, from all around the nation. Uh, and they're here to prevent, present brief lightning talks uh, on this work uh, and hopefully um, to uh, help build some of the connections that we've been really excited about here at the COVID Information Commons. It's a very networked community. It's a very collaborative community. And we do encourage you to reach out to speakers and others who are doing work uh, similar to your own and see if there are opportunities for collaboration there. Before we begin, uh, I'll just remind you, please uh, share your questions via the chat window. Our student Macy will be moderating this um, and a Q&A will be held at the end of the event today. Um, our speakers uh, will also be keeping an eye on the chat. I encourage uh, them to follow up if there are any questions that you're able to answer directly in the chat. Um, and any that we don't catch uh, will be saved for the Q&A portion at the very end. So uh, without further ado, oops, going back too far. There we go. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm really happy to introduce our first speaker today, uh, David Mendonca of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, who will be presenting on his eager. And I will stop sharing so that David can pull up his slides. Uh, David, we are ready when you are. Okay, we'll do. Thanks, Katie. Uh, happy to, to do this. And uh, first, want to thank NSF for the, uh, the support and also to acknowledge the, the many colleagues working on this project uh, with me. Uh, what I want to talk about today is really the role of engineered structures and services in supporting basic life safety, especially food and shelter during the response to this pandemic, and also to consider some of the implications of our initial observations for research and education, particularly in, in the fields represented by uh, the people you see here. The first example I want to consider is really the, the food supply chain. And uh, this is a, a critical infrastructure that is in a state of, of near collapse. And I, I don't think that's a dramatization of the situation. Uh, we're looking at a near term shortfall of about 8 billion meals in the United States, as well as uh, a drop in the number of volunteers and individual donations that, that normally come in. Um, I think one of, the, one of the real problems here is that we actually do have the supply, but because the, the demand on the other end isn't sufficient to pull that supply through, we're not getting enough food to enough people. Uh, grassroots organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations are trying desperately to adapt their, their way of working to, to meet this demand, but it's extremely difficult to do so. Uh, I think our main takeaway here is that it's, we've really got to conclude that some of the assumptions about the resiliency that's supposed to characterize the system could potentially be very, very wrong. Uh, second, 
again, uh, sort of moving away from food and now to, to where people live. Uh, lots of people do live in prisons. Uh, about 2.2 million Americans live in, in prisons these days. Uh, prisons have really proven to be sort of petri dishes of, of COVID transmission. Around 20% of the prison population is, in the U.S. is thought to be infected at the moment. Uh, one of the approaches that's been proposed is minimal is a selective release of, of uh, nonviolent prisoners, and uh, you know that's been done to some extent, but really minimally. And you know, re one thing that we can't do with uh, prisons is sort of redesign them for social distancing. So this is also an issue. On in parallel, uh, there's sort of eerie parallels here to uh, to the case of nursing homes. Again, about the same number of people um, in nursing homes and related facilities. Two point two million um, you know, limited visitation, limited movement. And as with prisons, outsiders are really the vector for infection. It's, it's worth noting, and this is sort of where the pandemic joint hazard element comes in, is that the risk mitigation guidance for COVID is really social distancing along with other measures, but this is directly at odds with what the risk mitigation guidance is for things like hurricanes, which we saw recently with Laura, which is congregation. Um, we're going to see more of this and uh, more uh, sort of disagreements between risk mitigation policies as, as we go forward. Pandemics aren't, aren't going anywhere. I think with both of these settings, uh, we really have to ask where are the opportunities for the residents of these facilities to adapt their behaviors in order to minimize risks to themselves and what kinds of tools are we providing for that? Um, I, I think it's probably no exaggeration to say that we are in the midst of probably the longest and most extensive reverse evacuation and shelter in place operation in human history. Um, but instead of leaving home for other spaces, we have really left other spaces for home and we really have no choice but to stay there. Um, as a result, if you if you lose your home, you not you lose not just a place to live, but potentially a place to, uh, to work and to learn. Um, so viewed from this perspective, you know, private homes are now critical. We, we need them in order to do the business of the country, learning and, and everything, but uh, you know, they're not supported as other so-called critical infrastructures are. Uh, Overall, I, I think what our work is, is bringing out is a, sort of two main sets of relationships. And you know, one is this, the first one between adaptation and criticality as society adapts to hazards, we find ourselves re, reinventing our notions of, of what's, what's critical and, and vice versa. And within, as we consider this relationship, we've got to consider the extent to which these our infrastructures, our built environment relates in realistic terms with uh, with regulatory frameworks. Um, I want to conclude by saying that we feel that there's an, an urgent need not just to support research that will address these concerns, but really in the longer term, we maybe need to develop our own adaptive capacity as scholars and, and educators in order to learn from the errors that we've seen in the in the past and respond to current challenges and shape the design of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Really fascinating and critical work being done. Um, moving on to our next speaker, as a reminder, uh, you are welcome to uh, put your questions for any of our speakers in the chat at any point. Um, and we will hold a Q&A uh, later in the presentation. Uh, so Mauricio, uh, please feel free to go ahead whenever you're ready. Can you see my presentation now, the presentation mode? Yes, thank you so much. And this is uh, Mauricio Terronis of uh, Penn State. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, I, I will talk about what we are currently doing, uh, trying to develop a portable device for the rapid identification of viruses, including COVID-19. Uh, using optical spectroscopy, which would take you, let's say, less than five minutes in, in, in detecting. So we're using, in our case, we're using carbon nanotubes that you can see here, aligned carbon nanotubes. We use them as filters and we're trapping viruses and enriching samples from patients. And the idea is to, to then optically detect it with Raman spectroscopy, which is a very fast technique. Uh, 
what you see here, uh, usually when, when viruses mutate and you have different sort of uh, variants or, or, or mutations is that the envelope protein of the virus starts changing and then your antibodies are no longer effective. And that's a problem. Sometimes you need to develop antibodies uh, uh, so that you can identify them, for instance, by PCR. But if you can trap them without the label, without the antibodies, that's what we're trying to do. So we're trapping new viruses and also trying to trap them and concentrate them without uh, the antibodies. Uh, uh, we're using aligned carbon nanotubes so we can grow uh, different arrays of aligned carbon, carbon nanotubes and we can control the intertubular distance of the tube. So in principle, we can uh, trap viruses of different sizes because the viruses range in size and morphology as well, depending on the types of viruses. Uh, the technology that we're using to concentrate viruses is it's these ones. So it's a size tunable enrichment platform. And what you see here is that when you have your sample, you pass it through, it's a microfluidic device. You are trapping your viruses in a, this three dimensional filter that uh, later on you can do different things with it and you, to, in order to identify. But you are, we are concentrating the viruses very, uh, very uh, uh, effectively. So uh, here is, you see an SCM image of the viruses. This is H5N2 that we have uh, enriched and we have trapped. And then you have uh, the viruses, they, some of them adhere very well to the carbon nanotubes. And then we have a technology to enrich viruses. And that's the technology we're currently using to use Raman spectroscopy, which is an optical technique to detect them. So what we do is it's, uh, we, we make these uh, large uh, devices, I mean, sort of, microfluidic devices, which are larger. And uh, we use uh, gold, in this case, gold nanoparticles to get a Raman signal. So you, you shine a laser, you get a signal, and then you get a spectra. So the type of spectra that you are getting, it's uh, for instance, for different viruses, you get these different peaks, different viruses, different concentrations. So you can use machine learning algorithms and then identify and detect viruses. And this is something that we're trying to do right now. Uh, so we have done it with flu viruses, and these are the current flu viruses that are circulating as well in the flu season. Uh, and you had your vaccines, uh, uh, flu vaccines included the H1N1, the H3N2, and the, and the flu B. Uh, and what we have seen is that you can see the different signals from the different viruses that you get the signals from the, from the envelope proteins. And we can identify with accuracies larger than 95% different types and subtypes of viruses, which is very good. So the project that we are currently doing with the eager is really moving forward as well in this direction because we're trying to do uh, coronaviruses and we're using coronaviruses from chicken. And here we are trapped with, you can see the trapped viruses uh, of the coronaviruses uh, from chicken. So uh, this is just comparing the uh, respiratory viruses from humans and the chicken coronavirus. You can see the is the same range, 5 to 2,000, 500 to 2,000, 500 to 2,000. And you can see more peaks here. So you have different peaks coming from the coronaviruses. So one of the things is, can we differentiate using this technique, uh, differentiate different strains of viruses? And we have tried 32 strains of, uh, of these viruses. Uh, this is the chicken coronaviruses. And we can see that depending on the year and the region, we can really identify them. So we can, you can see they are grouping them in different sort of areas. That means that we can really, in principle, we can identify different strains. And that's very, very important for, for our work. In addition, we have also uh, identified this receptor binding domain from the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19. And we can see the peaks and the signal from this, this domain. So right now, what we are trying to do is we want to improve the signal to noise ratio. Uh, so we want to get better, even better signals using uh, 2D metal. So using other substrate instead of the gold nanoparticles. And we are getting these sort of sharper signals. So we get sharper signals and better signals. Then we will be able to do even have even higher accuracy and, and better performance. And we want to deploy this in the field. And for doing that, we have this collaboration with JPL, with Sona Hosseini, with she can make this sort of a, a handheld Raman spectrometers, which you can deploy in the field. So that's what we are uh, currently doing. Uh, we hope to finish this design and we hope to get an improved signal to noise ratio over, over the following months. And this is the team of researchers. These are the students and postdocs involved and Sona Hosseini as well, who is part of this 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 uh, award thank you
Thank you very much, Mauricio, uh, for this great talk about all the great work you and your team have been doing. Um, next up in our lineup, we have Tracy Van Holt of New York University, who will be discussing uh, the pandemic's impacts on the U.S. food supply chain. Uh, so Tracy, uh, we're ready whenever you're ready to share your slides. Okay, um, just get to the, perfect. Everybody can see everything? Yes. Yes, okay, great. So we're, we're back to, to some of the food supply issues. Um, first, I just want to thank um, our team, project team across New York University, University of Florida and Arizona State um, and National Science Foundation for this work. So we were a team of you know, geographers, cultural anthropologists and um, supply chain experts. So of course, we're, we've all seen the news when the pandemic hit, there was news reports of you know, discarded products and part of this um, really highlighted a couple of things about our food supply chain. One, this is a picture of tomatoes and um, tomatoes in the US basically are for the, the restaurant supply networks. Uh, uh, tomatoes for supermarkets essentially come from uh, Mexico. And this is according to my colleague who works with uh, tomato farmers down in Florida. And so you know, the, the, our supply chain was really designed for efficiency in the restaurant and supermarket network. And what we're seeing um, as all the restaurants are closing uh, that uh, the system is collapsing in many ways. So, you know, restaurants now, of course, don't have as many customers, but they're still struggling to get products at the same quality and price. And they've also had to adjust their business models as we know for social distancing, et cetera. So this work is really looking at the pivotal role that um, supply network, restaurant supply networks really play in the food system. We're focusing on independent restaurants. Uh, they're really important in our economy. Uh, you know, small businesses, there are 500,000 small businesses that are small restaurants. 11 million people are directly employed and 5 million people in the supply chain. And a lot of small scale um, farms are also supplying these restaurants. Um, these restaurants. And they're facing different sets of operational challenges than larger um, franchises and larger businesses. So this is why we focused on them. So our focus is really to understand the vulnerabilities in the supply chain, um, as well as in restaurants and how they are adapting and responding. So a couple of questions we're, we're addressing is, what are the strategies that restaurants are using to adapt? And does their relationship with not only their suppliers, but other restaurants help them? Because there, there is very much a restaurant community. And finally, how has um, the supply chain shifted? So we're, we're working across our three sites. Um, one is in New York and Queens and in, uh, in Manhattan. We're also focused on Maricopa County um, and Gainesville, Florida. So as the pandemic has unfolded, of course, COVID, which was once a hot spot in New York is now a hot spot in some of the other places. Uh, so it really works for a rich um, research. Some of our methodological advances in supply chain research is one, um, it's really, there's, there's not a lot of focus on spatial analysis, we're comp comp adding that component, um, where we've designed our, our research uh, that's Zoom friendly, but based on ethnogra ethnographies. And finally, social networks, even though supply chains are networks, there's, there's a paucity of um, information on supply networks. And so specifically, the the vertical networks, the supply chain, as well as the horizontal networks, um, the restaurants. So um, this is, you know, one of our contributions. I'm just going to show uh, from some of our semi-structured interviews with the restaurant owners um, at the beginning, we've coded for these interviews and basically I'm going to show you a visualization of the, the themes. And so what you're looking at here, um, don't be afraid by this, this pretty figure here, um, are all of the words that, were, that, that, that restaurant owners were talking about. And we see two really big divisions. On the right-hand side, um, there's really focused on supply chain issues, distribution, relationships with suppliers, 
um, alcohol sales, um, drivers taking other routes, um, competition with other chains. And on the left-hand side, these are really operational issues. So it's how is the restaurant pivoting? How are they finding, um, you know, keeping their staff safe uh, with mask wearing? How are they, you know, a lot of their employees have left. So how are they, how are they handling this? And finally, just on the bottom, you could see a lot of this pivoting, pivoting to takeout. French fries don't travel well, as we all know. So there's a lot of food that have been designed for restaurants in one way that now that they've had to pivot, you know, has an effect on everything else. If we just focus on the main themes in all of these, it really boils down to a couple of topics in our, our interviews we're uh, conducting now are focusing on this. Again, this is like zooming into the most prominent themes on the right hand side. It's really about distribu distribution and planning and the supply chains. Uh, suppliers are not um, uh, pr providing the products at the same intervals as they were in the past, even if they are available. Um, and then really on the left-hand side, the COVID risk to staff is a, a big issue for the restaurant owners, um, getting their clients to wear masks when they're not eating. And then we see this sort of intermediary in terms of pivoting their business model and pivoting to takeout. So just in conclusion, you know, there's a lot of uh, factors that are contributing to uh, restaurant outcomes. And we hope that this research will inform not only information on strengthening um, some of our components of the supply chain, but also um, develop resilience to the, to the future. And finally, if you want to reach out to us, either me or any of our team members, um, feel free to do so. And to learn more, you can uh, see our website. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Tracy, for a really informative talk. Um, I encourage, especially if we do see some of these conversations starting in the chat, as I am seeing now, uh, I encourage speakers, if they feel like leaving their contact info in the chat for people to access, please feel free. We'll also be adding some additional links and other resources there later on today. Um, so being mindful of time, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Michelle Bufadel of N New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, so Michelle, we are ready when you are. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Do you see the first slide? We do, thank you. Okay, so uh, th this is a project, a rapid. Uh, uh, my name is Michelle Bufader, I'm the PI, and uh, Dr. Shaolong Leo Gang uh, is co PI. Uh, we collaborated uh, with various researchers in the nation. Uh, you can see the list here at uh, Princeton, Duke, Rutgers, Hopkins, University of Pittsburgh, and the University of Cincinnati. Uh, the first part of the talk is, is going to uh, focus on the uh, number of cases in the U.S. So we obtained these data from uh, Johns Hopkins University and, uh, you know, and they provided them daily. And then so we, we analyzed the spatial distribution of the number of cases. And then you can see here in March 2020 and then in May. Um, and then like, if you zoom in on a certain uh, region, let's say this is the Washington, D.C. area, we notice like the number of observed cases, you know, they are spiky. So you have like the high number, maybe this is this is DC or Baltimore, and then you move, and then there's nothing in between due to the smaller population, and then you have a higher number. So for us, that that's reminiscent of what's observed in you know in turbulence. And then so we we thought, okay, that the number of cases would be something known as multifractal. And uh, so we, we, you know, we, we, we got to investigate that. So the conclusion is that the number of COVID-19 cases is what you call scaling. And then, but it's not totally random. It is, it is correlated. And uh, we analyze the correlation using what you call the Fourier spectrum. So first, because it is scaling. So the, you can find a direct relation between what's happening at 10 kilometer, kilometers up to 2,600 kilometers. So initially, during the, the early phase of the disease, the correlation was small, you know, as you can, as one could deduce from the slope. As the slope gets, you know, uh, steeper, 
then it means the correlation increases. And then we notice that the, the spatial correlation of the disease converge towards the correlation, the spatial correlation of the population. Uh, and these are other multifactor properties that, uh, you know, they are in the paper, I'm not gonna discuss them now. And then for our investigation, we used a relatively simple model developed, you know, more than 120 years ago. It is called SIR model, susceptible, these are the people who could be infected, the infected ones, infectious, and then removed. Uh, these could be removed due to the recover or by death. So we, we, are, we use this model to try to, to capture what is happening. And you know, if you recall that spectral slope uh, figure, this is here shown as a time series using also our model, which is the, the line. And then one could note that we were able to reproduce the spatial correlation using that, that model. Uh, this is just an illustration of how our model functions. So we start with a population that is multifractal, and then we assign uh, you know, the model uh, for infection. And then you can see these, these are the number of new cases, of course, with time, the number of new cases with the subsides. The conclusion of this is that, uh, you know, the first thing was uh, the major finding for us was the population, the spatial distribution of population is multifractal. So, which allows us to explain why the, the COVID-19 spatial distribution is multifractal. Uh, you know, there are major work where they use big data to, to model the spread of the disease using number of people, using their phones. So our, our approach, you know, provides a compromise between the big approach, the big data approach and you know, fitting models at, in, at small towns, say at the scale, say of Newark. And there's always issues of privacy using big data. Uh, and the other, you know, again, this is maybe pure modeling, but we believe that paying attention to spatial correlation would constrain the model so it doesn't go wild. The next part of my talk is about the movement of uh, vir you know, viron or, you know, it's called them particles in the supermarket. Imagine this is a supermarket that is 40 meter long, you know, 20, 25 meter wide. And then you have the, the doors here, the red you know, arrows, these are the, 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 where the air comes from, vents, and then the, the white arrows are the return vents. This is hypothetical. And uh, so we use CFD simulation, the color trends to, to model the movement of air in the supermarket. And I wanna show here the results. Our focus was on the attachment of the particles. There are a lot of studies they, they deal with the transport. But for us, we say, okay, you know, what happened, you know, because we do know that the part, you know, the virus or the, the, the particles, they do attach to surfaces. So here you can see them attaching to the ceiling, the orange, they attach to shelves, you know, blue attached on the floor, uh, which is yellow. Whereas if you don't allow for attachment, you know, even after 20 minutes, you see them spread all over the place. So therefore the attachment on surfaces is important when you, when you wanna predict the indoor transport of viruses. Uh, this is, this is uh, one, one curve here where you have one graph, you have the concentration at five meters from a source, the source. This is without attachment of five micron droplets. So it is 20% the strength of the source. Uh, with 25% attachment, you can see this is like maybe 12%. And then with 100% attachment is like 10%. So we conclude that um, the attachment doesn't play a role, which means the type of surfaces in the supermarket is not gonna be, it's not gonna play a major role because there were discussions like, oh, should we use, uh, you know, metal or glass or plastic? We, based on these simulation, it seems it doesn't make a big difference. Um, one thing we investigated is also, you know, when they said, okay, there's one way in the supermarket so people could walk one way, one way aisles. And then we said, okay, well, one of the things that you could reduce, you know, the, the number of air particles, uh, the virus particles in the air is maybe you can create baffles. This is as an environmental engineer, we, we're used to using uh, to this concept for plug flow reactors. And then we conclude that if you place these baffles in the system, you are going to reduce the concentration of particles in the air. And, uh, 
And the other thing that uh, from the study is that the narrower the aisles, the better the air quality, which is kind of counterintuitive because every, you know, whenever you look at supermarket, you know, you look at large aisles and then it gives you the feeling that it is healthier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, definitely something I'll be thinking of as I, I pick up my groceries, uh, but super relevant and, and interesting research. Um, our next speaker coming up is uh, Jamie Hestekin of the University of Arkansas. Um, Jamie, uh, we're ready whenever you're ready to share your screen. Can you see my first slide? We sure can. Okay. You can just go into presenter uh, mode. There you go. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, well, this is a, a rapid project started um, in June and I am the, the, the PI and the co-PIs are Dr. Krista Hestekin and Dr. Peter Crooks. Um, so what, what I wanted to, to tell you all about first a little bit about is, is, is long-term disinfectants. So um, this project is to make long-term disinfectants for disaffecting hard surfaces, soft surfaces, lots of different surfaces. Um, we were working on an NSF project where we had um, we're making tempo um, modified cellulose, so tempo oxidized cellulose. And we found that by attaching certain groups, we could get it to, to be a disinfectant. There is currently only one long-term disinfectant that has been approved for emergency use by the US EPA. Um, there's the website um, dealing with that. Normally it takes about 18 months to get a disinfectant um, approved. Um, this one was obviously approved faster because of COVID. Um, there is a need for long-term disinfectants for both bacteria and viruses for now and when COVID beyond. Um, we're working with the University of Arkansas Medical School on these long-term disinfectants. And what we're really looking at is all of what goes into this. What's the best chemistry? What's the best application procedures? And what sort of potential lifetimes can you expect from these surfaces? Um, and this started as part of this NSF app score, as I said. So. And if my slide will advance, then we can, okay. So we started looking, we are making a lot of these different chemistries. I'm gonna tell you, show you one specific result today, but the easiest way to make the chemistry is ionically bonded materials. Um, there is long lists of approved disinfectants for different viruses and, and, and bacterias. And you can take those dis disinfectants and ionically bond them to, to the surface, your own surface, and so then and coat that surface on, onto whatever hard surface you want. So that's the easiest form. That's the form over here on, on, on the left. Um, the, one of the, the more difficult forms is we have a something that will make a paracid. And so what this will do is it will make hydrogen peroxide over the course of time. Um, and so, so by, by doing that for, for long-term, you can, you can put an oxidizing agent in, which will destroy things. Um, so that's a material we're testing as well. And then the third one is to try to take these chemistries and covalently attach them to the tempo modified surface. We've uh, developed the ability to put click chemistry on the surface of these tempo groups. And so because of that, we can, um, we, we can, really attach just about anything we want. And we're looking at some of the approved disinfectants for doing that. Um, what this shows you is some of our initial results. So this is with the easiest form, the ionically bound disinfectant. We used a common disinfectant DDAC and attached it to form one, which is one form of our tempo modified cellulose. Um, the form one says that every other carboxyl or every other hydroxide free group has been converted to a carboxyl and form two is one where um, they're all converted. And so it becomes water soluble in, in, in things. And what we, what we did here is we used E. coli as, as a first test. This is how fast E. coli grows when you look at it on a 96 well plate. And these are the different things that, and, and how they're growing out. And so if you look at this, our form one doesn't do much at all to stop the, the, the growth. Um, the DDAC and, and, and the, the form one with the DDAC both stop the, the, the growth when, when you did that. You move on to 48 hours, you can see that our, our surface is, is, is doing pretty well. 
after a week, after two weeks, we're still seeing um, close to complete, uh, b basically a, a com complete ability to destroy E. coli when we, when we put it into the surface. And this has a lot of error bars because these are all 96 wells a piece that are doing this. And the reason I put it on here, it gets kind of messy when you, when, when you do all that stuff. But over a two week time period um, so far, we, we can see that these ionically bond surfaces per work pretty well. As far as how they work on the surface, I'm gonna start a video here. Um, as you can see, and I, I guess the, uh, on, uh, on this video, that we have a surface that we've coated this on with a, a, a spray sort of surface. Um, it, is, it is a green spray surface because we put the colorant in. Um, we can scrape it, but if you just rub hard on it, it does not come off. If you spray it with water and a little bit of surfactant, on the other hand, you can get it to come off very easily. And um, a, a, a eventually here in about five seconds, it's gonna show that you can remove it all and your door handle looks the, the, the same way that, that you had before. Um, right now we were adding, uh, the green color has nothing to do with science. It's a marketing thing that people are interested that how would you know that something had had this spray done, but you can see it can go on and off pretty quickly. Um, and so right now we are also tests, which I'm not gonna show today, of, rubbing hard on this surface to see, you know, how much you can, can get off of the, the surface and such. And then just the last really quick slide, because I know my time is coming up, is we started with bacteria because bacteria is easier to test, not necessarily easier to, to, to kill, but viruses are, are a little bit difficult. Um, we, we are in the process of, of doing that right now to show we'll do that as well. We are developing the covalently bond groups um, and there's a lot of interest in, in, in this sort of thing, and we're interested in collaborating with any one of you as well. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much, Jamie. Uh, really appreciate that talk and the, the demo there. Um, our next speaker uh, today will be Wayam Ching of the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, so, Wayam, you are welcome to share your screen uh, and proceed whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so I have for that is, can you see the screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, have you hit the share screen? I, I should, um, but I'm not in the... <laughs> Sorry for the That's okay. Uh, share the screen. Yes. Share the screen. I'm sorry, can you see it? Not yet. Um oh there you are. Great. Okay. I'm sorry for the um falling up. So um so I think uh, uh, I'm. Uh, let me uh, go to the first slide. I restrict myself only to uh, five slides, and uh, I'm a Wei Yin Ching from University of Missouri, uh, Kansas City, and um, I'm a fearless, a fearless a computational fearless, and uh, so my result would be very condensed, and uh, I think anybody is interested could. Uh, uh, send me an email, I will answer all the questions. So we have a very small team and uh, consists of uh, the Hikari and uh, two very capable graduate students, uh, PhD student, uh, Mr. Jawa and uh, Sen, and an undergraduate student, uh, uh, Ms. Namik. You know. So we are supported by uh, NSF, a rapid project, which is in the condensed matter and the materials theory section of uh, NSF. And uh, since we are a computational scientist, we have to rely a huge amount of computational resources. And this was provided by the Department of Energy Supercomputer Center um, and called NERSEC. So I want to start uh, um, the, uh, the next slide. 
And uh, so I say something about the background and uh, why we want to start to uh, study the spark protein, because uh, this uh, is uh, uh, the protein bonds to the uh, host cell yeah, receptor. If most of the people know what uh, is uh, going on there. And uh, so it play a critical role in the infection. So the structure and the properties of this uh, and internal bonding uh, is not fully understood. You know? So we have to use the world-class supercomputer facilities to do our initial calculation based on density functional theory for this uh, large molecular system. You know? And uh, this type of calculation is very layer and uh, because it's very resource consuming and it's very challenging. So our goal is to have fundamental understanding based on quantum mechanical methods and the interatomic and intraatomic amino acid network, including the hydrogen bonding. You know. So we also, of course, the main focus is to train the next generation of scientists uh, in this very important area of material science, because I was trained as a material research and uh, I work in the uh, uh, condensed matter physics, uh, in um, chemistry and uh, biophysics. You know. So biomaterials are very important. So, uh, so I want to first report some of the latest achievement and uh, we have the structure optimization of seven basic uh, structure domains in the spark protein, which is uh, uh, right here. This is the free chance and uh, the chain A is, uh, has uh, seven different uh, uh, domains and each of them consists uh, up to several thousand atoms. And we have to do the computation for all the, these seven domains together, you know, and, uh, and in, investigate their covalent and hydrogen bonding and the partial charge distributions. You know, and we also developed a key parameter called amino acid, amino acid bond pairs, which would be able for us to do the three dimensional amino acid interactions. So we so far have published three papers. If any of you are interested, please send me an email. So the currently the ongoing projects we did is the interface modeling which we combine the molecular dynamics with DFT calculation. And this is even more challenging. And uh, we also try to calculate the rigidity of each of the spark uh, domains because the rigidity is uh, very important in any biological system when they are under temperature change or stress. Yeah. We are also currently working on the mutation modeling which is the D614G, which if it is in the news, uh, that uh, those are the variants of uh, different uh, uh, coronavirus and uh, is in the news almost every day. You know. We also want to improve the computational methods and the codes used for large data generation. So this is uh, a figure about the, um, and the mutation model with water molecules included. And this is the preliminary result on the rigidity. And uh, so we have a free manuscript currently now under population that will take us at least uh, two or three months. You know. So this come down to the one of the last slides. So we, our project will finish by the May 31st, which is only a one year project for the NSF rapid. So we would, um, before we end the project, we will extend our computational modeling to drug design with some selected models by adding of the very short peptides. So this is an example of two, um, two models, which we would, uh, sort of for uh, uh, start to model, which is called the LCB1 and uh, LVB3. These are the uh, two short peptides to be inserted at the interface. We also will do extensive mutation modeling and uh, on the analysis of the following cases, and 
in addition to the one we are currently working on, this is there are many new variants according to the B117 uh, um, <coughs> report from uh, um, COG United Kingdom. You know? So these are the four examples and there are many more. You know? And uh, we also want to longer go is to extend computational modeling to cover much larger biomolecular systems. Even though we are doing our initial calculation at this moment, it's one of the largest computation that can be envisioned, but uh, we are more ambitious want to extend to even larger systems. So on the other hand, we are very ambitious. We want to advocate the use of large scale computational modeling for biomolecular systems that can rifle or even uh, complement the experimental techniques in accuracy and at a much reduced cost. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, YM. Really appreciate uh, your insights here. Uh, so for our last uh, researcher today, uh, I'm going to introduce Rabindra Tiruvanziam um, of Emory University. Uh, and it looks like we have your slides up here. Uh, so please feel free to go ahead whenever you're ready. All right, if you are speaking, we can't hear you. Well, I think it's from unmuted. Uh, I was just saying thank you for the opportunity and uh, you know, it's 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 uh, nice to be closing the session after such a, a good series of talks. Uh, I'm an immunologist and a, an engineer here at Emory University in Atlanta, and the work that I'm going to be talking about was uh, funded by an Eager Award by a CBET, um, and it was done really by grad students in my group, Brian Dobosch. Um, a lot of the bioinformatics done by a, a postdoc in my group, Diego Moncada, and all the BSL three work, really the work with the virus itself, was done in collaboration with uh, Kevin Zandi. Um, and um, in the laboratory of Raymond Chinazi, who's a, a you know a, a prominent virologist and and um, and and, uh, and pharmacologist um, here in our university. So uh, as um, you guys know, um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is infecting um, a number of cells uh, in the body throughout the body, is uh, causing that disease, COVID-19, which is really a multi-organ disease. And um, even though you know, I think we need to. Think about the, the different organs that are being affected. Most of the morbidity mortality in patients is linked to the lung manifestation, and it is really due to the infection of uh, the uh, cells lining the lung, the epithelial cells, and that leads to, uh, in the complications of the disease, uh, the influx of uh, monocytes and neutrophils from blood, and then these cells sort of compound on the uh, the, the initial issue that was um, um, you know, caused by the infection of the epithelium. So uh, our mandate really uh, was to uh, use a system that we developed for other diseases in which we grow um, human airway cells at air liquid interface so that they, they mimicry the conditions in which they, they grow in the lung. And we can infect them with the virus for uh, different, periods, different periods of time. And then we can let uh, different sets of uh, immune cells, primary immune cells from human blood, uh, transmigrate and meet the virus on the other side. So we're really trying to mimic uh, the uh, sequence of events. So the, the viral infection, then the monocytes coming in, then the neutrophils. We can add drugs at any point in time uh, to affect infection or, or immune response. And then we can obviously analyze the different components in that model. Uh, and we use a lot of different omics methods. Our goal is really to characterize the steps in pathogenesis and also to uh, check for uh, potential benefits of candidate drugs. And I'm gonna show you a, a few data that, that um, basically you know, report on our progress. On the epithelial side of things, obviously you wanna make sure that uh, in our system, uh, the virus behaves similarly to what we've been seeing in vivo. This is really the case. Uh, I'm showing you here a quick comparison of SARS-CoV-2 with PR8, which is an H1N1 influenza A virus, and OC43 that you can see here is one of the common cold coronaviruses. And right away, you can see by RNA sequencing and heat maps that I'm showing you here of a few families of genes that, um, you know, with the, with the influenza virus, antiviral genes are really hot, so they're red. 
but the coronaviruses are really uh, much colder. So this is one of the, um, the areas of interest uh, in, in uh, pathology and also in therapeutics. Coronavirus seems, coronaviruses, and especially SARS-CoV-2, seem to be very good at uh, preventing the activation of antiviral pathways in epithelial cells. On the other hand, if you look at the cytokine genes here, there's really discrepancies between the three viruses. And we can see right away that SARS-CoV-2 um, is uh, able to activate an IL-10 response, but not so much an IL-8 response. So it's really promoting more of an, a monocytic um, inflammation to begin with, and uh, neutrophilic inflammation comes after. So this is really what, um, what we see in vivo. Now, uh, the model is really uh, unique in its ability to combine epithelial cells and, in, and virus and immune cells. So we can, for example, look at um, in the process of this, uh, uh, of this uh, infection of those two cell types, we can look at the effect of drugs. So baricitinib is an immunomodulator that was approved uh, by FDA, remdesivir is an antiviral, and uh, they work in, uh, through different mechanisms of action. There's obviously uh, interest in combining them. So we can see that we can combine both drugs, we can actually block the migration of monocytes secondary to the infection of the epithelium. So that might be uh, responsible for some of the benefits that we see for uh, those drugs when they're combined in vivo. Uh, we can also look at the viral burden in the different uh, compartments of our model, in the uh, epithelial cells, in the monocytes, in the extracellular fluid, and we can combine uh, all of those to look at the total viral burden. And you can see again that the combina combination of remdesivir and baracitinib in uh, you know, six to 10 different um, replicates here uh, shows a, a decrease in the total viral burden. Um, more importantly, we can also look uh, very much in depth at the um, molecular response in terms of transcription and, and all other functions that you're interested in, in the epithelial cells, in the leukocytes. In this case, I want to illustrate uh, our ability to show, for example, in the context of no drug, uh, that the uh, monocytes uh, that are infected by SARS-CoV-2 show a huge decrease in the transcription of, of interferon and also the sting um, RNA sensor. But uh, by the same token, the infection is increasing the uh, uh, transcription of, of IL-1 beta and also IL-8, which we know are going to lead to the uh, recruitment of neutrophils. And again, we can look at the effect of uh, dr single drugs or drug combinations in that system at the uh, transcriptional level. Uh, what's really interesting is that um, you know, there was a paper in Nature yesterday showing that um, alveolar macrophages show a huge burden of SARS-CoV-2. At the time that we were you know, working on our study, we actually didn't have a lot of uh, data uh, going in that, in that direction. So we realized by computational uh, means, this is a work that we did in collaboration with Gosen Lab at Emory, uh, some single cell RNA-seq data from bronchoalveolar lavage of mild and severe COVID patients who are all hospitalized. And we found a population of um, monocytes in the lung that show exactly the same uh, type of transcriptional activation upon uh, encounter with the virus, but they are very high for IL-8 and IL-1 beta. So we think our model mirrors in, in vivo data, both on the epithelial side, also on the leukocyte side. So in summary, we have the ability to recruit monocytes, infect them uh, by SARS-CoV-2. They produce a proneutrophilic uh, response. All of this is mirrored uh, you know, between our, the in vitro model and, and in vivo situation. There are a number of questions, obviously, that we're asking in this model, both in terms of the virology and the immunology. We uh, have now this model under provisional patent uh, for drug testing, because we think this is sort of the most urgent um, effort that needs to be uh, put together. And we're testing a number of immunomodulatory antiviral and pro-repair drugs. Uh, so, uh, you know, more in the um, next few months on this. I'm just gonna finish here by acknowledging uh, folks in my lab, uh, folks in the Shinazi lab, Gosen lab, Gibson Lab at Georgia Tech who uh, helped us with some of the transcriptional analysis. And again, the, um, the Eager Award that was um, instrumental in, in um, having us you know, start this project and pivot from our uh, work in lung immunology to, uh, to COVID-19 research. And this is my contact. I'm gonna stop there and I'll, I'm happy to take um, questions in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Rabindra. Uh, really appreciate that in-depth talk. Uh, and again, I encourage people to uh, share their questions in the chat. Uh, and speakers, please feel free to drop your email addresses in there uh, to help facilitate uh, any sort of back and forth that may uh, emerge from this.
So to be mindful of time, um, I'm going to go straight to our student presenter next. Uh, we'll save uh, some of the remaining questions for the end if folks are able to stay on a little bit past the hour. I know we're running a bit long. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we got to the uh, undergraduate student paper challenge I mentioned at the beginning of the hour. Uh, so our next speaker will be Helen Yang, uh, a student at the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, uh, who is going to tell you, uh, I know we have a few students on the line uh, today, uh, fill in a little bit more about the challenge, including some of the resources uh, that are available for undergraduates to leverage. Uh, so Helen, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you so much, Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Helen Yang. I'm a student at Columbia University and an assistant at the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub. So we announced the launch of the COVID Information Commons Student Paper Challenge during last month's webinar, and we've been thrilled to see so many students and researchers already interested in participating. So today, we're excited to announce a few important updates and share some resources that students can use to develop their paper ideas. So for a quick overview, the Kick Student Paper Challenge is an opportunity for undergraduate students of all academic backgrounds around the world to learn about COVID research and apply what they're learning in class to current real world issues. So the webpage for the challenge can be accessed from the homepage of the Kick website at covidinfocommons.net. The page contains all the information students or researchers interested in serving as mentors or judges need to know. So essentially, the challenge for students is to leverage the KIC resources to write a four to five page double spaced paper on a topic related to COVID research of their choice. So it's an exciting update, which we've coordinated with the Columbia University Libraries team, is that winning papers will have the opportunity to be published not only on the KIC website, but also added to the Columbia Academic Commons, an archive of scholarly work produced by Columbia students and affiliates. And authors of winning papers will have the opportunity to present their work at a future KIC community webinar like this one. So the webpage lists key dates for the challenge, a few of which have been updated since last month's launch. Students interested in participating should submit the participation form, as well as a title and short abstract for their paper by February 15th. We're also looking for mentors interested in holding office hours in late January, February, March to help students develop their papers uh, and judges to help evaluate the submissions. So if you're interested in sharing your COVID research experience with students, please fill out the mentor slash judge participation form by March 1st if you're interested in serving as a mentor and March 15th if you're interested in being a judge. Filling out the participation forms and checking back to this webpage will ensure that you'll be kept updated with any new announcements about the challenge. So we recently recorded a video going over all of the information about the challenge and the uh, that this webpage provides. We also recorded a video demonstrating how students can leverage some of the resources on the KIC website to help develop their papers. You can access both videos on the challenge webpage. To give a brief summary, we invite students to explore the three search tools that KIC provides for the over 900 COVID-related research projects the NSF has funded to date. These include the COVID Research Explorer, a tool that uses machine learning to visualize research trends, the NSF Awards and PI database, our most recently developed resource, or the simple NSF search by director. There are a variety of ways students can use these tools to learn about research projects and find the topic they'd like to write about. For example, the COVID Research Explorer tool provides tree map and topological map views that group awards based on common keywords and other fields that students can customize. Students can adjust the settings of the maps to analyze how research has changed over the course of the pandemic or differed according to region, for example. And like researchers, many of you who have been using this tool to identify collaboration opportunities, students can also look at potential cross-disciplinary areas of research. And in the query box to the left, students can add search terms to learn about research on different topics. The COVID Research Explorer tool provides details about individual awards, but another resource students can use to learn about specific projects is the KIC NSF Awards and PI database, which can be accessed from the homepage or the menu of the KIC website under KIC search, tool, KIC search tools. Here, students can easily search by keyword and filter their results. For example, typing supply chain into the search bar brings up 28 results. Clicking into any of these awards, again, provides full details about the project. A unique feature about this database is that clicking on the name of the PI will take you to an individual page with some information about the PI and their work. Many PIs have provided additional information about their projects, such as their lab websites or articles about their progress. Students can use this information as a starting point to learn about specific projects. And finally, for a general overview of COVID-related research, students can look at projects being funded under different NSF directorates, which we've linked on the main page of the KIC website. Students can explore different projects under uh, a directorate related to their major, for example, to get a scope of the research being conducted in the discipline. 
So there are many more resources besides these three tools available on the KIC website that students can use, including curated data sets, guides, and articles. Students are also welcome to use resources not on the KIC website. So we'll wrap up this overview for now, but for a more in-depth demonstration of how students can use these three KIC search tools and leverage other resources, please watch the demonstration video at the bottom of the challenge webpage. And if you have any questions about the challenge, please email info at covidinfocommons.net. We hope you're as excited as we are about this opportunity, and please share it with any student who might be interested in learning about and joining the discourse on COVID research and consider participating yourself as a mentor or a judge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Helen, for that great overview. Um, I know that we already have a number of students and several mentors and judges who have signed up to participate, uh, which is really exciting. And we do encourage uh, any of the folks on the call today, if you're interested in serving in a mentor as a mentor or judge, please do sign up. Um, and uh, for anyone who has any questions, please feel free to share this in the chat. Um, Helen, if you could actually share the bit.ly uh, for the direct link to the page in the chat so that folks could get a closer look if they'd like to, yes, that absolutely. would be cool. Um, and uh, I think we had a few questions from our fantastic speakers earlier as well. Uh, so Macy, if you could cover any of the questions, if you could read any of the questions that aren't yet answered uh, from the chat, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Katie, and thanks again to the speakers for the presentations and for keeping up with questions in the chat. Um, we have one remaining question, which is to YM, and Miranda Lynch asks, have you explored how to add glycans to the structures for the spike protein being used in the computations since it is known to be heavily glycosylated? Yes, so this question is addressed to me. Uh, I'm uh, in the process of uh, modeling many different types of uh, uh, scenarios that other researchers are interested in. And uh, so I, I want to establish any possible collaborations with their suggestions. But uh, since uh, my, my knowledge in the above, uh, <coughs> Biology is, uh, is very limited. So I would uh, ask people to send me by directly by email so I can have uh, a lot more detailed um, planning or discussion to, uh, to you. you know. I, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, I am. Um, are there any additional questions, Macy? at this time. Um, no, that's it for questions in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. I do see a remark um, from Anastasia uh, Angelopolo, uh, apologies if I have mispronounced that, about uh, the abstract submission deadline. Um, thank you. We uh, really want to uh, consider how best we can encourage students to participate. Um, I'm going to just drop our contact email in the chat. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and uh, if there's any way that I think we can help your, your students participate, I'm sure we're more than happy to discuss that. And I see Florence has added the uh, remark there as well uh, about the timing that we've uh, pulled together for this challenge. So, well, I know that we're a bit over the hour uh, and I want to be mindful of time. I do encourage uh, folks to reach out to the speakers and for these conversations to continue. We've had many exciting collaborations um, occur uh, over the course of these events uh, and it's so excited to see them launched again in the new year. Uh, our next event will be coming up on February 10th. Um, and I will just pull that screen up real quick so that you guys have that. Uh, but it is February 10th, 2021, um, and we'll have another lineup of uh, seven more great speakers. Uh, and we do encourage you to register uh, and, and join in. Um, so thank you again to our speakers today for their excellent presentations. Uh, thank you to NSF uh, and the entire KIC project team for all of their support. Uh, and many thanks to our great student moderators who have chipped in today. Uh, so we'll leave you with that. Thank you.